Welcome to the ADF Mobile Insider Essentials series, which documents some of the essential skills, tricks, and techniques for developing ADF Mobile applications. My name is Frédéric Debien. I am a member of the ADF product management team. This presentation is about using the local database. We have four points on our agenda today. First, we'll have a look under the hood to see what exactly makes the ADF Mobile local database tick. Then, we'll ask ourselves, what is it good for? When should you use it? After that, I will give you some code samples in order to teach you how to use it. And finally, we'll cover the few limitations you have because the local database is incredibly powerful and well taught, but there are a few differences with server class database engines like Oracle Database or MySQL. So I will explain everything about those limitations. So when you look at the global ADF Mobile architecture, you see lots and lots of components. Up to now, in our ADF Mobile Essentials, we gave lots of attention to the presentation layer. So we've covered AMX pages, we've covered local HTML5 pages, we've shown the ADF controller in action. Also, we have a series on interaction with the device services. So all of this is all and well. But in today's session, we concentrate on really what makes the core of ADF Mobile. And that means the Java VM that we ship with your code, as well as something called SQLite. What is SQLite? SQLite is an embedded database engine. So it is well suited for mobile uh, applications. And SQLite is embedded in the iOS and Android operating systems. So basically, it's a native feature of those OSs. So what Oracle provides for the local database support is a Java API on the top of SQLite. When you use the local database in your code, what you do is straight JDBC calls. And this reinforces the point that ADF Mobile is all about reusing your existing Java skills. It's true for the presentation layer because it is very GSF-like, but is, it is also true at the database level since, as I said, it is straight JDBC. SQLite enables you to manage any number of databases you'd like on the device, and those databases can be encrypted or not. Obviously, encryption is strongly recommended because who wants to put his precious data at risk on a mobile device that can be stolen at any time? So why is SQLite a good choice for the use case we are covering? Well, SQLite first is really transactional, fully transactional. That means it supports the ACID semantics. So it is always atomic, consistent, isolated and durable when you do a transaction. So if the device crashes, if it loses power, you're sure that your data won't be corrupted. Also SQLite is self-contained. So you don't have external dependencies or anything. And as I said, it is already part of the mobile operating systems that we can target with ADF Mobile. So you don't need to provide anything or to add a jar to your application. SQLite is serverless, so there's no server process that will run into the background or anything. Obviously, this reduces its scalability, but that's not necessarily a problem on a mobile device. And finally, SQLite is really zero configuration. You just open the database and make straight JDBC calls and everything will work. So SQLite is a great product. And by the way, Oracle is a member of the SQLite Foundation, so we support this open source uh, product. At this point, we know that SQLite is a great technology, but 
why would you exactly need a local database for in your ADF mobile application? Most of the time, ADF mobile applications will use web services in order to read and write data on a remote server. But there are three main use cases for a local database. First, if, if you need to produce an application that will work whether there is a network or not, then you can use the local database and your application will be autonomous and will work even in fully disconnected mode. Also, you can use the local database as a cache for remote data. Mobile networks are great, but most of the time they are unreliable. They can be slow at times and bandwidth on them is consistently expensive. So, could be a good idea to cache some of the data you're getting from those remote servers. And finally, you can use the local database as a transactional buffer. And by that, I mean, when you do a web service call, there is no rollback. Everything is committed to the remote database straight away. But you're not sure that your web service call will work. So it could be a good idea to save the data locally. And if the web service call fails, you can retry the transaction at a later point. This way, you won't force your users to retype everything if there is a network failure, for example. Obviously, not all applications are covered by the, main, uh, the three main use cases I list on this slide. But if you need the local database, chances, chances are they will be in one of those three categories. Typically, the local database should not be used to store user preferences. There is an extensive preference management feature in ADF Mobile. So please use that unless it doesn't cover your needs because the preferences and settings are very, very complex. Now, you're convinced that you need a local database for your application. But before you start doing those JDBC calls, you need a database. In SQLite, each database is contained in its own file, and the file is managed by the SQLite backend. You have two ways to create a database. First, you can execute DML statements like create table, create index. On the other hand, you can also use a preceded database file. This file is packaged with your code and then you move it at a specific location in order for the application to use it. Whatever method you choose, you need to execute some code from a properly registered lifecycle listener implementation. The dev guide explains you how to do that. If you want to create a preceded database, there are some tools on the market that can help you with that, and some of them are free. Now, you have your database file. In order to establish the connection, you do very, very simple JDBC calls. So the first step is to get the path to your specific database. This path is obtained through the ADFMF Java Utilities class. It will retrieve the correct value for you, so you don't have to mind about the specific file system of, of the device. Then you just use this path, add the database name at the end, or I should say the name of the database file, and finally open the JDBC connection. As you see, very, very straight code. Be aware that we provide at this point no ORM layer for the local database. And that means you really, really stay at the JDBC level. You don't have something similar to ADFBC currently in ADF mobile. Suppose now you want to encrypt your database. This is very, very simple. The only thing you need is a password that you handle as a string. And with this password, you will be able to encrypt so ADFMF Java Utilities contains an encrypt database method that you use. If you need to decrypt a specific database at some point, you simply obtain the connection 
and then use the decrypt database method as shown in the slide. Once again, very straightforward JDBC calls, and in this case, uh, we've got the help of ADFMF Java utilities. SQLite is a very powerful database backend, but it's got some limitations. The first one is about concurrency. At any time, you can have several read-only connections to the database, but a single read-write connection. So, if your application is multi-threaded, and probably it will be, you need to take that into account in your design. Also, SQLive is SQL 92 compliant, but does not support the full author join and write author join statements. Once again, you need to design your queries around those limitations. Also, SQLite will support data types for the database columns. So when you do a create table, you specify the type for each column. But at runtime, it will not check the type of the values when you insert them in the table. And that means, for example, that it is possible to put a string in an integer field. So you need to be extra careful in your validations. And finally, SQLite supports encryption. But apart from that, you don't have any management of user rights. It's all or nothing once you get access to the database. So there's no grant statement, there's no revoke statement. If you need to segment access to data according to level of user privileges, you will need several database files. The transaction support in SQLite is very powerful, but it's got some limitations as well. For example, there are no nested transactions in SQLite. You get only a single top level transaction at any time. Then, when you do a commit, you have a single read-write connection. That's our concurrency problem. So if you have several connections open and you try a commit on several of them in a sequence, only the first connection will commit successfully. The other ones will switch to read-only and the commit statement will fail. You need to take that into account. And finally, the rollback statement is supported, but it will fail if you have open result sets. Once again, you need to design around that specific limitation. Over time, SQL Lite database will grow because as you had records, the database store those records in something called pages. And those pages will take more and more space on your on the file system. When you delete records, sometimes though some of those pages will be empty and will be marked as such by the database. Those empty pages are added to a list of empty pages. When you insert new records, those pages that are free are reused. But suppose you delete and insert lots of records. At some point, your database will look like the one you see on the slide. Lots of empty pages. But SQLite does not release the disk space occupied by the empty pages, unless you do something. And what you should do in such cases is to enable auto vacuum. If you need to recuperate the space occupied by those empty pages, you need to configure the database in an appropriate fashion. Auto vacuum will resize the database as needed, but it must be configured when the database is created. After that, if you need to enable it, you will need to create a new database file, enable auto vacuum, and move the data from the old file to the new file. In order to enable it, it's very simple. You establish a database connection and you execute the pragma auto vacuum equals full statement as shown on the slide. So when auto vacuum is enabled on your database, what happens is automatically 
the empty pages will be moved at the end of the file and then the file for the database will be truncated by the SQLite backend. So the empty pages are purged from the file and you don't have a list of empty pages. Then if you add records, it will grow as usual. There are some things you should know about AutoVacuum. The first one is that over time, as you insert and delete records, your database will suffer from fragmentation. This probably will not be a problem because I don't expect you to insert millions of records in your ADF mobile local database, but it could happen. If this causes performance problems to your application, your only option then is per to periodically recreate the database. So you create a new database file, you move the records from the old one to the new one, and then you delete the old one. Then you solve the fragmentation problem. Unfortunately, at this time, this is the only way you can solve the problem. AutoVacuum will take care of the database size, but not of fragmentation. And this is the way it is implemented in SQLite. So currently, there isn't much that Oracle can do about this. In order to illustrate the concepts we've seen today, I've built a sample application. There are two components in the application. One is a web service, and the other one is an ADF mobile application. The mobile application is made of a single screen. On this screen, we display a list of countries. This list of countries is fetched through a web service. The web service was built using ADFBC on the top of the HR schema that is part of every Oracle database installation. When the web service is not available, the application will fetch records from the local database. The records I put in the database are for fictitious countries, so you can distinguish data that comes from the web service and data that comes from the local database itself. By the way, the web service was built using ADFBC, as I said, using a SDO-enabled view object. That means we are using a service-enabled application module. So now what I will do, I will simply activate airplane mode on the phone. The phone will now uh, detect that there is no network connection. When I will refresh the page, I will display records from the local database. And that's it. It is very, very simple. And as you can see, it works. Those records come from the local database, not the web service. Now, let's examine the source code for the ADF mobile application. The first thing we have a look at is the Lifecycle Listener EMPL class. This is a Lifecycle Listener that we have defined in order to execute some code when the application starts. The method we call here is called Initialize Database from Script. The name is self-describing. What do we have in that method? Well, basically what it does, it reads a SQL script from the device's storage and will execute it one line at a time in order to create the local database if it doesn't exist. So, first step is to log our entry in the method. So the utility class that's offered by ADF Mobile enables you to do that. Then, what we do, we simply retrieve the path here to the local database file. We check if it exists or not, and this is standard Java IO uh, semantics. And if it, if it exists already, we leave the method. Otherwise, we create it. So that's the two lines here. And it's really important to note that um, when you open a JDBC connection on a SQLite database, 
the database file will be created if it doesn't already exist. The set auto commit here is really important because we will only commit at the end once we have executed all of the DML statements in the script. The next few lines are simply meant to retrieve the actual DML script from the storage and store it in memory. And after that, we iterate here line after line in the script. If a line starts with rem or commit, we simply skip to the next one. And the actual execution of each line of each statement happens here where we do call the execute method on the statement class. There is uh, some exception handling because uh, every JDBC operation can raise uh, some exceptions. And we simply ensure in a finally statement that we actually commit and close when everything has been executed properly. So the code for this lifecycle listener is fairly straightforward. This listener must be configured in the application in order for it to be invoked. And the way to do this is to go to a specific descriptor, ADFMF application. In ADFMF application, you can see that we've got lifecycle event listener here. So as you can see, we are simply declaring here that we want to call lifecycle listener EMPL. So nothing really complicated here. All right. So now let's have a look at the classes that do the actual work inside the application. At this point, it's important to remember that our application calls a web service and retrieves data from the local database from the same page. So we couldn't bind the page directly to the web service data control. What I did is very simple. I have a data control for the web service. It's here. And I have a data control, a POJO data control, that I use to bind the page to. The code behind that data control will make the decision to call the web service or to read data from the local database. Let's have a look at the implementation for that. So here I have a class called CountryDC. CountryDC is the POJO I exposed as a data control. CountryDC contains a method called getCountries that returns an array of CountryBO objects. CountryBO is a business object that replicates the structure we've got in the database. And uh, at the same time reflects the kind of data structure we're getting back from the web service. So I have the country ID, the country name, the region ID, and some support for property changes. This facilitates screen refreshes when uh, you implement that. And by the way, uh, those methods uh, about the property change support, you don't need to write them, you just right click, and in generate accessors, you must simply ensure that notify listeners when property changes is checked and JDEV will generate everything for you. So CountryBO is just a very, very simple object that will host the actual data. So now in CountryDC, what do we do exactly in order to determine if the network is available or not? Well, we simply evaluate an expression language expression. So in ADF Mobile, you have the device scope scope, and that scope is reserved by ADF Mobile for a variety of properties that enable you to determine what are the hardware properties of the device the application is running on. In this case, we read hardware.network status. Um, the classes we use in order to read the value are really, really neat and provided by ADF Mobile. So we've got a value expression. So that's the result of the evaluation of an expression language expression. And we simply read the string value from that. So now, if the value is equal to not reachable, we, we put it 
in a constant at the top of the screen, then we execute get countries from DB. Otherwise, we execute get countries from WS for the web service. So getting countries from the database is very, very simple. It's straightforward JDBC. So we first get a connection. So we've got a utility class that's called connection factory. We're getting the connection from there because in SQLite, uh, remember, you can have a single read-write connection at any time. So connection factory ensures that we have that connection, that single connection, and that we don't create extraneous connections on the top of that. Then we use the statement class and uh, we execute a standard SQL query. So select country ID, country name, region ID from countries. Very, very simple. And we iterate on the result set. We read the various values for the three columns we have and we put that in a country BO class that we add to a list of return values. We've got some exception handling here. And uh, at the very end, we ensure that we close the connection. Very uh, important not to leave it open. Finally, we make a call on the collections Java class to ensure that we sort country BO. Uh, because uh, that's something I didn't show. But uh, at the very bottom of country BO, what we have are three methods, equals, hash code, and compare to. When you want to implement the compare to method in, on a Java object, you must ensure that you also implement equals in hash code. That's a best practice. So in this case, we simply ensure that we compare a country to another by comparing the country name. This enables us to sort the results very, very, very easily. And that's exactly what we are doing here. Collections.sort on the list of country BO objects. And then we translate that to an array because uh, when you bind uh, from a POJO, it's better to have an array than to return a list. So very, very simple using basic Java utility class. What we have below is get countries from WS. And here we are making a standard um, web service call from, from the code. So the return value when you invoke a, a web service data control is always of generic type. And when you do the call, you must specify the name of the data control. You must specify the country, uh, not the country, but the, the name of the method. Um, and then we have three values where we would have had the types the names and the values for method parameters. In this case, we don't pass any parameters, so we just use empty array lists. The return value is then translated as an array of country BO objects. And this is the generic type bean serialization helper class that's provided by ADF Mobile in order to facilitate the translation between your custom Java object and the generic type that is returned by the web service. So in this case, we specify that we are getting back an array of country BO objects. And that array of country BO objects is stored in the result uh, variable that we have in the data control. Because if we open find country here, we see that we have a return value and then the name is result. And on the result, we have the three attributes. And those attributes, their names must match what you put in, your country, in our country BO object. Because otherwise, the, the generic type being serialization helper won't be able to map the values between the two objects. So we have an array of country BO objects. And we sort it once again. And we return that. So as you see, it's very, very straightforward to have business logic that will either get data from the local database or call a web service in a very transparent way. And in the screen, the screen itself, I mean, the binding when you do it, as I did here, is trivial. So if we open the screen, we see that in the bindings, we have simply a tree binding 
on countries iterator on country DC on the countries um, element because uh, we've got uh, the get countries method exposed on that specific data control object. So in the screen itself, it's very, very easy. We just bind here our output text to row country name. That's all. And the list view is bound to simply bindings countries collection model because what we've got is a standard tree binding. So as you see, the application is very simple. And I ensured to submit this application to the ADF Enterprise Methodology Group uh, samples repository. So the URL for that is on the screen right now. So you can actually download for yourself the code, play with it, and uh, do whatever you, you, you want with it, basically. This is the end for this edition of ADF Mobile Insider Essentials. As you can see, the ADF Mobile Local Database is a very powerful feature. At the same time, it is very easy to use because you use straight the JVBC calls. If you'd like to learn more about ADF Mobile, please go to the link listed on the slide. There, you will find downloads, tutorials, discussion forums, samples, and even more resources. On the other hand, if you liked this video and like to stay in touch with me, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm known as Bloober Recorder, and you can read my official blog at blogsoracle.com slash Bloober. Also, we've got our YouTube ADF Insider channel. Please subscribe to it. That way, you will be notified every time we put a new video on it. And believe me, we've got lots of interesting things coming down. So, I'm Frédéric Devienne. Thank you for watching this ADF Mobile Insider Essentials.